So you're very welcome, everybody, to the next episode of the Paving the Way Home podcast. And we're absolutely delighted to be joined uh, by a priest from the United States today, Father Joe Freedy from the Diocese of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. Father Joe, you're very welcome. Thank you. I'm so happy to uh, so happy to be with you. I'm uh, thrilled. I was in Ireland last year. I was actually scheduled to come to a youth conference and uh, it got canceled at the last minute. So I had like seven free days in Ireland. It was amazing. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. That's right. That was in the uh, in the summer of 2018, wasn't it? That's right. We were. I think it was around the week of the of the World Meeting of Families here in Dublin. Uh, that that's it. That's it. Father Joe, before uh, we go any further, could I just ask you to lead us in an opening prayer? Sure. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you and praise you for this day today. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of our Catholic faith. Father, you know uh, the hearts of everyone who's listening. You know our needs. You know our cares and concerns. You know us better than we know ourselves. So we, we just open ourselves to you. Just ask you, Father, in the name of Jesus, to pour forth your gift of the Holy Spirit upon us to increase in us the gifts of faith and of hope, especially to anybody who's discouraged or feeling alone or feeling down, Lord, that you would just fill us with your gift of hope. We ask you, Lord God, to please increase our understanding of your love for us, that we may love you more. And just ask you, O oh, Blessed Mother, just intercede and pray for us. You love us so much, and you are our mother, and we claim you as our mother, and you've claimed us as your children. So just take us under your mantle. Take us into your immaculate heart. Just be with us and, and fill us with joy and with peace in this time that we have together. We ask this all through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, Father Job, um, obviously, you're a you're a priest of the of the diocese of uh, Pittsburgh, but um, I know I've actually read it quite a bit um, about you over the over the last few years, and because I know you're you're a regular speaker in the Steubenville conferences and uh, and things like that, and your background is of an athlete of a footballer. Well, when I I, I have to I have to clarify when we in Ireland say the word word footballer. Uh, I know a lot of Americans go, oh, you have football here. We we have a completely different sport that we refer to. But I know in this case, in this in, for, for the purpose of uh, of this podcast, we we allow the term football related to American football. So you were uh, you 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 were an athlete. I was, yeah, yeah. You wouldn't know it from looking at me now, but I was, <laughs> was. yeah. And uh, so our our high school, after you go through the, I'm not sure uh, the terminology in Ireland, but you go through your first grades like an intermediate school. And then we get into high school, so your teenage years, and uh, that's when it gets a little more serious. In Pittsburgh and in uh, southwestern Pennsylvania, it, football is a it's a big deal. And so uh, you know, Friday nights they call it Friday night lights here, and the whole town would come out to uh, come out to watch the games. So yeah, it was beautiful. And then I was able to to play football in college, and. Uh, Played for played for five years and and just had an amazing time and you know some of the some of the bigger name celebrity football players over here I was able to play against so that I wasn't very good my team wasn't very good but uh, it provided me an avenue to preach the gospel because you know a lot of times I I would go into the schools and the kids would you know say oh, here we go another priest. And then I would name somebody that I played against and it'd be like, oh, you know, <laughs> a little bit of credibility. So now, now I could preach the gospel. So you know how it is, right? With your podcast, it's like the Lord, the Lord uses everything. All of our experiences, good and bad, uh, when we give them to him, he, he makes something of them. So it was a beautiful time for me personally, but, but it's also kind of, you know, kind of the name of your podcast. It just paved the road for me to be able to preach the gospel a little bit more effectively. That's fantastic. And when you were playing, were you always practicing your faith? Were you very much into your faith? No, I, I had a, a big conversion. So I was raised Catholic, but uh, I think like you guys are experiencing there and like we're experiencing here, um, so many people have fallen away from the faith. So in the United States, uh, 
four out of five kids that received the sacrament of confirmation stopped practicing the faith before they're 21. 52% of adults have left the church and 70% of those who, uh, you know, claim to be Catholic, say they're Catholic, uh, don't come to mass. So I think, I think what happened for me was, was very, it's kind of very typical uh, that I knew the what of being Catholic, but I didn't know the why. So as Catholics, we know the what, right? We know we dip our hands in holy water, we know we make the sign of the cross, we know we genuflect, we know we go in the pew, we know we sit, we know we stand, we know we kneel. But that, in a certain sense, like that's not enough to know the what. It's the why behind the what that makes the what so beautiful. And me growing up in a Catholic home, I, I didn't, uh, it would, you know, it, made, it might have been explained to me, but not in a way that I could receive or understand. And so uh, my faith became very like w routine. I just did it. And, and all the statistics say most Catholics stop practicing the faith, uh, not because of something dramatic, although that's the case. Most Catholics, 82%, stop practicing their faith just because they stopped practicing because they never really knew why they were practicing in the first place. So when I was in high school and college, I did the Sunday mass thing. I knew that's what you did, but my life was not at all uh, concomitant with my faith. I was, I would say I was a, I was a pagan for sure. <laughs> I was living a, a bad life. So, uh, you know, typical university life, at least over here with the, you know, all the things that come along with that, with the partying and, and all those things. So no, I, I was not, I was practicing my faith uh, only, only in word, but my life was certainly not uh, in conformity with, with the faith and my heart wasn't with the Lord. And what happened then? How did you go from there to now wearing a collar every day, celebrating the Eucharist? <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good question. It's a good question. A few things happened uh, that I, I always always talk about and I would say this as well um my parents gave me a great foundation and so I, I to, to any parents who are listening that your kids have stopped practicing the faith just to encourage you parents that if you've given your children a foundation and a base um they have something to return to so I know it's such a heartache for parents whose kids don't practice the faith um but I, I just I just want to encourage you and give you hope as you're praying for them and hoping that they'll return, that they have a foundation. And that's what my parents gave me was a great foundation to return to. So the things that really happened that I think changed my life was I, I met a, a, a good friend of mine who used to get very nervous before football games, and I did too. So we started to pray together, just a little prayer, and that began to open my heart. Then I, I always uh, kind of comically tell the story about I met a, a beautiful young woman and uh, she wasn't preachy. She wasn't like, uh, you know, what would Jesus do, Joe? You know, she wasn't like that. She was just herself and her witness really helped me. Uh, and then I became, I, I became the starting quarterback. So I went from not playing at all to being the guy. So I had to grow up a little bit. And then uh, the, the two real big things was I went home at Christmas. There's an author named Scott Hahn. And uh, he wrote a book called The Lamb Supper. And I was like super bored. Our Christmas break over here is like a month. And you're bored after like 10 minutes. And so I was like super bored. And, and my parents wisely used to leave books around the house, hoping that us kids would pick them up. And I picked up this book, The Lamb Supper. And uh, for some reason, it was a moment of grace that I began to read it. And it just explained the mass. And I've been going to mass at that point, I guess, for 20 some years, probably 20 years, 21 years. And I had no idea what was going on. Again, I, I knew what, but I didn't know like why we did anything. Why does a priest wear black? Why does the priest put on those vestments? Why is there an altar? Why candles? Why? Well, he starts explaining these things. And I'm like sitting on my couch, blown. I'm like, why didn't somebody tell me this, you know? But certainly they had. I just, I didn't receive it or they didn't present it in a way that, that a kid could receive. So I started to like understand, holy cow, like this is amazing. And, and what was going on in my mind was less powerful than what was happening in my heart. What was happening in my heart was I began to, um, I guess just real honestly, I began to experience God's love for me. 
And I, I had a lot of fear and anxiety in my life that I suffered from and I still battle with. And when I began to experience his love, um, I started to be set free. And, and not, it wasn't an instant. Sometimes we tell our conversion stories and even I do that like, oh, my whole life was changed. It wasn't that. But as I began to experience his love, I began to understand it, that, that I found it or, you know, it, he found me like all these other things that I was trying to fill my heart with, all these other things that I was trying to ease my anxiety with, they just weren't working. And I realized that his love, it, it really was the answer. Like John Paul II said, Jesus Christ is the answer to the deepest desire of the human heart. Like only him. It, it's not, you know, and it's typical, so I don't mean to be boring, but it's not money, it's not power, it's not pleasure, it's not fame, it's not popularity, it's not the girls, it's not the drinking, it's, it's just not. Like we're, we're wired for God. St. Augustine, you've made us for yourself, oh God, and our hearts are restless for they rest in you. That was me. And so I go back to college and uh, I, I began praying for good friends because the friends that I was with, and I was kind of a leader of the pack, the friends that I was with were living this bad lifestyle. And so I knew like if I stayed in that friend group, I was just going to keep doing what I was doing. And so uh, I started to pray these very specific words, Lord, give me good Catholic fellowship. And I didn't even know what that meant. I just, I like saw it on a poster. I need fellowship, you know? So I was praying, Lord, give me good Catholic fellowship. Give me good Catholic fellowship. And I was at uh, Eucharistic adoration one day because people told me that was really important. And I got up to leave and my friend Janelle, who I didn't know at that time, she became my friend, tapped me on the shoulder and she said the exact words, uh, excuse me, are you looking for good Catholic fellowship? <laughs> you know? so I was like, yes, I am. <laughs> so honestly, I, I, uh, I, I attribute kind of m much of my conversion and, and the saving of my priesthood, my priestly vocation to my friends that came around me and uh, they didn't take me from my other friend group, but they gave me the community that I needed to live this way. C.S. Lewis said, if you want to know a man's character, look at his friends. So again, to the parents, uh, whenever, whenever parents ask me to pray for their children, I always do, but I always pray that their children would have good friends, that good friends would come into their lives because we become who we surround ourselves with. And if we surround ourselves with the right people, that is godly people who are trying, uh, who are, you know, into their faith, who want the Lord, we're going to end up catching that, right? One of my priest friends says, Christianity is caught more than taught. And it's both, right? But, but everything's like that. It's, we become what we contemplate. That is, if we if we watch bad movies, if we read bad books, if we hang out with the wrong people, that's who we're going to become. If we're listening to good music, if we're watching good shows, if we're hanging out with the right people, if we're, what we take in is what we become. So that that's really how a lot of my conversion happened was learning my faith, you know, the Lord blessing me with with friends who are full of their faith. Well, it just goes you to it just goes to show you the power of of being witnesses of Christ, like your friends here. Because when you were with even with the with the greatest of intentions and the greatest desires to come closer to God, if you didn't have that support around you, um, you know, I guess all the temptations of secular world and society would could have could have choked you. And I wonder what I do. And there was a point you made there about the fulfillment of all desire, and I only come back to it because. As, as as we record this, it's um, uh, it's Wednesday, the twenty first of October, and our spiritual director, Father Patrick Cahill, uh, he gave a homily today, and he was just talking about like what is the what are the basic uh, needs what, um, of, of our life, and, and and basically he was coming down to uh, love after obviously food and shelter, uh, it's love, but yet you know sometimes we sometimes we can you know we can go to social media, we can go to people, we can all be looking for this. Um, affirmation so to speak but the only full 
a true fulfillment of all our desires is God. So that was a, that was the point. Um, for me, um, just listening to you because uh, like coming back into your faith and my story was uh, was very very much similar to that. Um, insofar as I was just going to mass on a Sunday, but other than that, I was. Um, it was just like maybe 30 minutes in the morning and that, but again, I, I go back to my parents, particularly my mother, uh, her, her example, her witness, uh, particularly with the rosary. Uh, and for me, the rosary has always been a, a, a very, uh, a very important part of, uh, of my life and my daily life, same with my marriage now and, uh, with our family prayer. And, um, recently in, in, in the past few weeks, I was, I was, I watched a, a two minute video by you and it was on the power of, of just one Hail Mary. Uh, can I ask you to, uh, to, to explain that one again? Sure, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a powerful story. My friend who told it to me, uh, when he told it, he told it like it was no big deal. And I was like, John, that's an amazing story. So I said, do you mind if I tell it? He said, absolutely, Father Joe, please. And uh, it's a very simple story, but this is a buddy of mine in Pittsburgh his name is John Petrovich, and really normal guy, good guy. And uh, he was jogging one day around uh, his neighbor, a neighborhood that he wasn't usually jogging in. And uh, he saw an ambulance in, in somebody's driveway. And he thought to himself, should I stop, uh, see if everybody's okay? And then he, he thought, well, I'm not a doctor. I don't know this person. So he said, I'm, I'm just going to keep running and pray one Hail Mary. He said, that's what I did, Father Joe. He said, I, I didn't stop. I didn't kneel down. I didn't fold my hands. He said, I, I just prayed one Hail Mary. And he said, honestly, I didn't think anything of it, you know. And he said, the next week, he's running around the same neighborhood. And he hears a woman uh, shout out, you know, hey, hey, you, hey, sir. And uh, he said, I kept running because <laughs> I, did, I didn't know anybody in the neighborhood. And uh, then finally, she said, no, you. And, and he turned around. He said, me? And she said, yeah, she said, you saved my life. And he said, oh, I, I, uh, I don't think so. I, we don't know each other. I, you know, I'm not from around this neighborhood. She said, no, I recognize your face. And he was very surprised. And she said, last week I had a, um, I was rushed to the hospital in an ambulance. And I was in the hospital and I was dying. And she said that Jesus appeared to her. And he held out the palm of his hand. And she said, your face was in the palm of his hand. And she said, you are going to die. But because of the prayer of this man, you're going to live. So it, it just goes to show, right, the, what you, exactly what you said, the power of the intercession of Our Lady through one Hail Mary, which, of course, is all scripture, right? The Hail Mary is scriptural. Um, but I think what struck me about the story, and you know, it seems to have gotten out there a little bit, so it's touching a lot of people. Uh, it, it is the power of the intercession of Our Lady, but also that like she's listening and she cares. You know, there's a beautiful scripture where um, you remember the story of Martha and Mary, and Martha says, "Mary's sitting at the feet mm -hmm. of Jesus," and, and Martha says, "Lord, don't you care?" You know, my sister's left me to do all the serving. Don't you care? And uh, we can feel like that sometimes, right? At least I can. Like, Lord, look at my life and look at the world and look at the country and look at the church. And like, don't you care? And and for me, the story is this. He cares. And our mother, just like our natural mother, right? Like, they care about the details of our life and the burdens of our hearts. And sometimes we, we have this idea, like I shouldn't be feeling this way or I should be holier than this or I, should, I shouldn't be down or I shouldn't. And it's like, God doesn't look at us as a bunch of shoulds, right? Like you should be better, you should, you should. God and our blessed mother, um, they look at us as their very dear children who they desire to be uh, saints, right? Not for their sake, but for our sake. So they do care about the intimate details of our lives. And uh, this one, how Mary was prayed, 
you know, kind of in passing. And if she cares about that, how Mary, how, how much more does she care about the hair, the how Mary really offered from the heart, really prayed well, uh, all the how Marys that we prayed, like they have been heard your prayers and they've been heard. Yeah. That's a, uh, that is so powerful. Um, I'm just even thinking there as you're t- talking about it, like the amount of times that we may have, you know, on the motorway come across a car accident and, you know, you might be on the way to a meeting or to an appointment and you're getting frustrated because of the, the traffic, the delay, and you don't think about a prayer, even just that, a simple prayer, that simple Hail Mary, Hail Mary, what that did there. And if that one Hail Mary from the heart can do that, what can a rosary, a complete rosary from the heart uh, do? And I, that's a point where you spoke about, where you mentioned there about praying from the heart, how important that is. Um, you know, sometimes when, when, you know, people starting out maybe or praying the rosary, they can find it a little bit, uh, maybe monotonous. And after, a, a, you know, a few minutes, it's the mind is gone. You're thinking of, oh, what I have to cook, what I have to do or, or, or whatever. But that's key. It's, it, it's praying from the heart. One question I just want to ask you um, regarding more of a practical question really regarding the rosary is and some people have asked uh, me this before obviously you're, you're praying the 10 Hail Marys per decade but you're always met you're also meditating uh, on the particular um, mystery um, uh, of that rosary how do you do it are, are you focusing on the words of the rosary or are you focusing on the mystery or is the rose the words of the rosary more of a background mantra and you're focusing on the on the gospel scene or just from a practical point of view, how would you answer that? I would say both. You know, it just kind of depends. Um, what, what I do, just because it's helpful for me, and, you know, we talk about ADD, attention deficit. There's nobody more ADD than me. My mind is bouncing off the wall. You know, it's like a thousand different things. So it, it's a challenge. It's, but what I do is, um, like, if I'm praying the first glorious mystery, the resurrection. Um, I might think of a scripture passage uh, associated with that, like the scripture, what the angels say outside the tomb, why do you seek the living ones, the living one among the dead? And I might just meditate on those words, or I just meditate on that gospel scene on Christ coming out of the tomb. Um, so I, I, I think I probably usually meditate on the mystery. I, I think one of the traps or temptations that uh, I fall into is when I'm praying a rosary for something, like let's say I'm praying for my sister who's having a hard time or something like that. A lot of times I, I'm praying the decade of the rosary and I'm thinking of her problem. And what the Lord has kind of shown me is, you, you take your intention and you give it to me, but then you take it back. You know, it's like, so the Lord is like, Joe, when you give me your intention, you give me your intention and you think of me. So I've really been trying, you know, with some success uh, to meditate, to, to get whatever I'm praying the rosary for, I let it go and I just pray. There's a beautiful, I can't remember which saint Jesus said this to, but Jesus said, you think of me and I will think of everything else. Because sometimes we, we think and we think and we think and we think and we take our problems and we think and we think and we think and it, and it, and it just drives us crazy and gets us down. So when I heard that quote, it really set me free. It's like, wait a second. I don't have to think about this every day, all day. And the Lord's like, no, you think of me and I will think of everything else, you know? So that, that really helped me to be, to contemplate better. It was like an ability to be able to release so I could just be with the Lord. That's powerful. And so for people, sometimes uh, Catholics, uh, as Catholics, and particularly when we're very devoted to the rosary, some people can maybe, who, who may not understand uh, the rosary and how, and, and how devotion to Our Lady works, may accuse us uh, as Catholics of making Mary another God and saying that, 
well, you're only supposed to worship God, but why do you, wor- why do you worship Mary? Uh, how, how would you answer that? I think in, in two ways, right? The, the first is um, very practical, like right when I'm when we talk about Mary and the saints and their intercession. Um, if I'm going through a hard time and I have a friend, uh, I say to that friend, "Would you pray for me? I'm just struggling," you know. So when we die, we don't go out of existence, and the saints in heaven. Don't just like, they're not like unaware of what happens on earth, right? Like, so it's very natural for us to say to each other, hey, you know, pray for me. Susie, pray for me, or Tim, pray for me, or Sally, pray for me. So we're merely going to our older brothers and sisters, namely the saints, and saying, pray for us. Now, why does the Blessed Mother have particular pride of place? Um, There's, you know, we could give months of teaching on this but she's the mother of jesus and back in the day in the old testament um the queen and i know you know this i'm sure the listeners know this right the queen was not the wife the queen was the mother and the queen held the you know the authority the 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 opportunity to influence the king right so the king was actually the queen's son so mary being the mother is the queen right and at the we know well at the foot of the cross right jesus said to john and john is called the beloved disciple he didn't call himself john in the gospel because he wants us all to know that we are in the place of him that all of us are him at that moment um woman behold your son and can you imagine can you imagine mary when Jesus was dying, and he said, woman, my brother David died when I was 25. My mom lived every day by his bedside. When David said, mom, she ran to him. What, what is it, son? What can I do for you? Anything. So imagine Jesus on the cross with his mother at the foot of the cross saying, woman her heart must have exploded what son anything you tell me what you tell me what do you want me to do and jesus says behold your son take take these spiritual children that i'm giving you as your very own children and so that continues through all eternity that this bursting of the heart of our blessed mother to i want to fulfill your dying wish jesus what is it i want you to take your spiritual children she takes that very very seriously um and so we should we should too because he didn't end there he said now son which is all of us daughters sons right behold your mother so with his dying wish, not only did he say to Mary, behold your son, but he said to all of us, right? With my dying wish, I desire you to behold your mother. And we can be very sure that this mother will lead us right to Jesus. She has no desire uh, for her own glorification. <laughs> she only lives for the greater glory of God, as the great Jesuit saying said, ad majorum de gloria the greater glory of god that's amazing and like gosh and i guess i just listened to to there like how the queen was not the wife but it was the mother having um you know having a i suppose to be able to have a special word into the year and i, I guess that's it with our lady we, we we don't worship our lady we honor our lady do we worship god but that is that is absolutely uh that is absolutely powerful when we think of saints like padre Pio, um relatively modern saints um for our times Padre Pio very much spoke about the rosary being um the weapon of our time now that's a very strong word for people going some of people might go really but sure it's just a, a load of Hail Marys our father's glory glory bees but as you as was as you spoke about the, that story just that one Hail Mary is so powerful of like praying a full rosary and praying a rosary every day can it can change life. It can change the world. Right. 
Change the world. It's a game changer. What I can't remember. I don't have a very good memory as you're, as you're hearing, <laughs> but uh, I can't remember which saint said it, but he said, say the rosary, save the world, right? So, right, it's, it's a powerful prayer. And the word weapon is appropriate. And why is it appropriate? Because Mary is the one who crushes the head of the serpent. So we're in a battle. We are in a spiritual battle. God is the Blessed Mother, the angels and the saints, they want us to live with them for all eternity in heaven. But there's fallen angels, demons, that want us to live for all eternity with them in hell. So there's a real battle going on. And so the language of it being a weapon is appropriate because we are in a battle. And we fight, you know, St. Paul says, not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, right? Um, and so our weapons don't look like the weapons of the world. They look very different. And one of the most effective weapons that God has given us is the Holy Rosary. That's amazing. Um, I remember a couple of years ago, I was asked to give a talk to some uh, children who were preparing for the confirmation. And I was talking about the, um, the rosary. And, and some of them were asking about, like, well, why do you pray the rosary when you can just go straight to God? Um, and, and this was an analogy, uh, I, I spoke to them and said, it's almost like you're standing on the main line, land and you're trying to get to a, an island and the island is, is Jesus. Now, you can go try and go direct to him, but there could be sharks, there could be all of these different things in the, in the water that, um, that can pull you under. But once you pray the rosary, the rosary is like stepping into a boat and the boat is taking you directly to the island. And once it's there, you step off the boat and now you're coming directly onto that, which is Jesus. And in that, in, in some ways, that's the way I, I suppose I, 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 I was explaining it to them is that, you know, the rosary is, is, one of the, is one of the surest and safest ways to Jesus, because that's what Our Lady does. She does not, um, like, it's, it's, a, Christ, it's a Christocentric prayer. Christ is at the very center of it. So it's not as if Our Lady takes all the glory for herself. Everything is pointing to Jesus, just like, I guess, the... Uh, the miracle at the wedding feast of Cana, Our Lady is pointing to Jesus the whole way, saying, "Do as He tells you." Absolutely, yeah. I think that's a very helpful uh, anecdote that you share, an analogy. I, I, I also, our God loves mediation, right? Like Jesus didn't just appear on the earth; He came through Mary. He didn't have to come through Mary. He's God. He could have just shown up, but He chose to come through Mary. God doesn't just choose rain, right, to just appear on the earth. He fills the clouds with moisture, and the clouds pour down rain, right? He loves mediation, right? He uses, he uses mediators in everything that we do, right? Uh, the leaves turn green because of this process with the sun hits the this and the that. Well, God can just turn the leaves green, but he loves mediation. So uh, this idea that God just wants us and God, us and God. Well, when I look at out of creation and every other aspect of life, it's not just that. It's not us and God. It's, it's us and God and everything else, right? It's like, I, I don't know. How, we look at creation, right? And it's like God made the, the trees and the, the antelopes and the octopus and the deer and the fish. and the, This is what God is like. It's full and abundant and wild and creative and mediation and going through and going through and get... so it's like of course of course Mary and all the saints it only makes sense with the kind of God that we have that's amazing uh Father Joe I know your your, your time is limited but just before we finish up <clears throat> have you any last word of advice or of wisdom for anyone who is trying to begin or delve into uh, a relationship with Our Lady um, and they might be struggling in, in, in any way, would you have any advice for, for someone like that? Yeah, I think um, I would tell her, tell her and tell God, you know, like, Blessed Mother, I heard on this podcast where there was this priest from the United States that it's important to have a relationship with you. Can you help me with that? You know, like that's a really good start. Um, or Jesus, it seems important that we have a relationship with the Blessed Mother. 
Uh, and I don't feel like I have one. Please help me. And then I would say, just start. Just start praying the rosary simply. And don't, if you're not praying the rosary at all, maybe start with one decade, 10 Hail Marys. And, and don't do it full of pressure, right? Just be at peace. Most of the time when I pray the rosary, I'm either driving in the car or I'm walking. Because for me to sit for 15 minutes is like, ah, you know, it's like, so I walk and I pray the rosary and I look at the birds and I look at the trees and I, I don't do it full of anxiety and stress. Like I have to do that. I have to, you know, I just, so anybody, you know, any advice I would have to give them, you know, it's not wisdom, but advice would be just, just let the blessed mother know you'd like to have a relationship with her. Let God know that. And then just start in a simple, simple way. And don't, don't put a lot of pressure on yourself. That's beautiful. That's fantastic. Listen, Father Joe, thank you so much for giving of your time. I know it's uh, it's very valuable. And when we made contact with you, you were back to us so quickly and just so obliging. And we're so, so grateful to, uh, the, for giving of your time to join us in this podcast. Just before we finish up, could I just ask you to lead us uh, again in a closing prayer? Yeah, I'm very humbled to be with you. And uh, yeah, very, very appreciative. So uh, that anybody would want to talk to me. It's always a, <laughs> it's always a nice thing. So thanks. We'll pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And Father, we we do just thank you and praise you. And uh, Lord Jesus, you have given us our Blessed Mother, and so we just give ourselves back to you, Jesus, through her, as you came to us through her. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray for, for us sinners now. now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Joe. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.